I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein and welcome to Inside Fashion. Today we'll be talking to Pauline Trugere. For nearly 40 years, Pauline Trugere has been known as 7th Avenue's designer and tailor par excellence. Her dress and coat designs, both functional and elegant, are intended for years of use. It's a pleasure to welcome you here, Pauline Trugere. Well, it's very nice to be here with you. Thank you. As a child, you spent a lot of time in your father's shop in Paris. Did observing his work affect your choice of a career? Actually, Barbara Lee, I wanted to be a surgeon, not just a doctor, I wanted to be a surgeon. And Papa said, absolutely not. My daughter is not going to play with cadavers and, you know, dead people. So I'm cutting dresses instead. How's that? <laughs> my father was a tailor, my mother was a dressmaker. So I really actually uh, breathed the work. It, it uh, some kind of amuses me and fascinates me that sometimes I am considered a critic or a teacher at Parson at the other school, FIT, I had really had no schooling in learning what I do now. My schooling was something absolutely of my own. All my mistakes are my own, they still are. All the things that I've learned, I learned by myself. And it was a very hard, hard learning process. Well, from the very beginning, and you say you still can remember and still sketch the very first dress that you designed. Well. I can sketch nothing, if you really want to know the truth, because I'm not a sketcher, but I could make a little sketch of the very first dress I made for myself. I was 13 years old. My mother got me the pieces of fabric and I cut it, and in those days I even sewed it. Right now I hate to sew, can't. At the concert, at the theater, I make little baby sketches, which is, the minute I put them on a piece of paper in a taxi when I go to work or back ho home, those little things, it's like a remembrance, like making notes at night of the telephone calls you have to do in the morning. But to make a sketch that means anything to anyone, I don't do it. I cut directly on a live model. By the way, about that first dress, won't you verbally sketch it for us now? What did it look like? It was a plaid taffeta with little pleats at the bottom and three little organdy colors, which each, each one was piped with the color of the plaid. One was blue, red, and green. And it was some kind of a, I was very big when I was 13. Well, I was as tall as practically as I'm now, and I was fatter. So I went to my first dance with it. It was all right, I guess. At that time, <laughs> did you harbor any notion of becoming a fashion no, designer? No, really not. Honestly, I didn't. You I, said that you have not had any formal training as a designer. Have you ever regretted that? No. I always said that I would have liked to give one week, even an hour of my life, but one week, one month, to have worked with Balenciaga or with Madame Lanvin, to have worked with them. And that, uh, I never had the chance uh, to do so. This I regret that kind of learning on the spot to see what people do. How do you think your work, your designs, would have been affected if you had the kind of apprenticeship that you refer to? I don't think it would have been affected in another direction because I think what I've got within me is still with me. It's something that I respect extremely good quality of everything. I would have probably have an easier time starting, maybe. Look, I started in America when I came here. I was really a little housewife with two small children. And I had a husband who really didn't want his wife to work. He didn't like the competition. That's why I'm not married to him anymore. <laughs> and that's not, and it's true, you see, a European husband, I suppose. And I, America fascinated me the first time I put my foot in New York City on the 6th of uh, January, 1937. Under what circumstances did you leave Paris and come to there New York? There was a little man named Hitler somewhere in the horizon. That was uh, the only reason why I left my home, because we had a wonderful life. I had my education, everything was French. I was born in Paris, right in the Place Pigalle. There was no reason for me to leave, except that that's my husband's vision. And I, we all thank him for that. So we came here with no money on, en route to Chile. For a reason, we came here for six weeks, and here I am over 40 years, so you can imagine. <laughs> and how did you begin this business from this how housewife with two children? What was I that first with, workroom like? And I begin 
my very small career as an assistant to Travis Benton at Eddie Carnegie. And it was a tough job. I never assisted anybody. I like to be the boss somehow. I must have had that in my blood when I was little too. I worked with this man who gave me sketches with trains of dresses starting here for, you know, like that. And I had to find a way to make those clothes. I made the muslin. I learned then. And I learned a lot because I had to do it. And Miss Carnegie, uh, who we became good friends later on, uh, used to say that she could not understand a woman designer. She, she never believed in them. She liked men designers, or she had many. She had Jean-Louis, she had Travis Benton. She had, of course, the great Norman Norell, and she had Bruno. There were no women designers with T. Carnegie, and that was the reason why I didn't work with her. I left. I left uh, December 1941 after something called Pearl Harbor, remember? The 7th of December 1941, Pearl Harbor, was closing everything. So I was in the street with no, I was making $65 a week. Then it wasn't too much money, but it was $65 a week. So there was nothing to do. I went to see two or three friends of mine. They gave me, actually lent me the fabrics, like 10 pieces of, 10 cuts of fabric. And we made, I made 11 dresses. Where did this all take place? In the workroom of Etty Carnegie, who by that time they said that she was also closing. So I took over this little office of Etty Carnegie and I had immediately doubled the rent. You know what it is to pay $50 and then all of a sudden you pay the double? But I took over the lease and that's where I started. 18 is 56 in 1942. Well, I worked late in those days and I remember wrapping my feet in paper like they do to keep warm and I cut my very first hundred dresses and then we got somebody who came at night to help me they came they worked on 7th Avenue until 5 o'clock and then from 6 to 8 they worked with me or to, you know I did all kinds of Saturdays Sundays it isn't like today today nobody wants to work but I worked very hard and very long hours what gave you the strength and the drive to go on with you it? know what I had to eat this is as simple as that no, it's, there was no drive because I wanted to become a great designer. I didn't know my capacity. I didn't know what I, I didn't know what I could do. But I had two small children and a mother, and we all had to eat. And that's the drive I had. I really had to produce something to come and pay the rent. And then we really started the Trigier House, my brother and I, in 1942. By 1945, we were way on. The, uh, we moved from 56th Street to 57th Street in a much, much, much bigger place. It was tough going, but here I am, so I guess it was all right. Looks better than that. I noticed that there are three turtles on your shoulder and at least one crawling up your leg. And a few in here. A few in there. When and how did you come to choose the turtle as the Trigère signature? Actually, it's not a Trigère signature. I had a friend many years ago, in 1945 to be exact, who was in the jewelry business and he says, why don't you do something that will look impressive and doesn't take too much gold? This big turtle here, without the diamonds, these are real, <laughs> after many years. The real, we made this turtle, it was all right, so then we cast this one and then we made the baby and the grandbaby. And then in 1949, I got my first Coty Award. So my brother, who was then my partner, gave me a turtle from Fabergé. And then two years later, I got a return award. So he gave me another turtle from Fabergé. Now I've got five turtles. <laughs> but it, now today, I've got 972 turtles, and it becomes this, it's a scary thing, the turtle. What has the turtle come to symbolize for you? Well, I tell you, it's a sign of longevity, sturdiness, uh, happiness. And when I went to Japan, I bought all kinds of things with turtles, everything. In 1942, you first established the Trigère firm, and then by 1945 already, the name was becoming quite well known in the New York fashion world. I believed in what I was doing, and I made a certain type of clothes, but I made a very classical, tailored, well-cut dress or coat. I think I made clothes of quality. I think I trusted only my good sense. We experiment with an awful lot of, uh, of cuts, and in my long career, we've done big coats, small coats, fitted coats, reversible coats. But I think that I know what works. Also, I think maybe I have a certain advantage. 
I wear the clothes and I wear the clothes. I am a hard person to, I mean, I travel a lot. I am not uh, particularly uh, careful. I take the jacket, put it not on the floor, but so the clothes have to perform for me. Let's come back to those beginnings for a moment. How did you get your clothes worn or your name known in those very first years? Very simply, or maybe not so simply. We had no money. My brother was my partner. He simply put the few dresses that we made in suitcases, and there were no way of flying. There were no, there was no, 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 no planes, and they, we couldn't even afford the, the the train to go to Chicago. So it was buses going to first Nan Duskin in Philadelphia, uh, Millie Oppenheimer in Chicago, opening the suitcase in the front of those women who were looking for something different, taking out the dresses. We didn't even put them on hangers. Today, nothing is shipped without hangers. And one customer led to the other, and that was the only thing. There was no secret. They just came back for more. I had to learn what a size 12 meant. I had to learn what a size 14 meant. We couldn't pay the rent. We couldn't put it up, please. We couldn't pay the telephone. We, it was an awful, Well, awful what made the business turn around? What made it come to life? Well. It's funny. I went to see Mr. Louis Adler. Somebody said, go and see, the, go and see the, the landlord. We couldn't pay the rent. So I asked for an appointment. And I went and I said, Mr. Adler, I'm at your mercy. I can't pay the rent. He said, so? So I said, I can't pay the rent. He said, what do you want? I said, I can't. I don't know. He said, so for six months, you don't pay the rent. Go and work. He said, well, there is a bank who just opened at the corner and they are looking for customers. I said, I don't understand that. A bank is looking, yes, it's a chemical <laughs> bank and it's 39th Street and 7th Avenue. I'll talk to the man. So he did. And this gentleman came, a man by the name of Mr. O'Hara, and I said, what do you want? I said, I don't know. Can I see a statement? I said, I was told not to give it to you because it's a very bad one. He says, may I see it anyway? So he saw it and then they called me back and I said, come and see us. I will never forget, it was the 15th of August, 1952. It was hot as blazes. And they asked me all kinds of questions. I started to cry. And the man said, the president of the bank, he says, how much do you think you need? For, to come? I said, I don't know, $40,000. He says, oh no, my dear, you couldn't do it with $40,000. You need at least $75,000 to start uh, you know, going. I said, really? Yeah, we'll give you 65. And I looked at him, and that's the way it turned out. It took a long time to... I suspect there are very few things that you do do in an ordinary way. In fact, even your working day is described as completely unorthodox. What makes it so? Well, I have no system, really. I try to have one. It's very difficult. You know, I am at the head of a business which I think has a very good name. I hope it has. But it's still a very small business. If five pieces of goods arrive from Europe, uh, with a defect. I know about it. I wish I didn't have to. Um, if a worker has a toothache and doesn't come, I know about it. If somebody's having a baby, I know about it. You know, it's not a big business where I could be completely detached. The only thing that I resent is the fact that at a certain date I have to produce a collection and I have to have it finished. That to me is the worst. You don't like deadlines. I don't like deadlines, but we have to have them, you know. They come, they come five times a year. And, uh, but I will never be ready with all the things that you want to do. You start to dress and maybe it's going to be good, maybe it's going to be bad, you don't know. So even, th even though you think you are on the right track, so you make six dresses or six coats and say, this is no good, you start again. But when all of a sudden something happens and everybody smiles at it, I say, that's it. So then we go on and do more and more stuff, you know. What's the design process like at Treasure? Do you have a hand in every aspect of design? Uh, you mean in the actual garment? Oh, yes. Oh, sure. Well, otherwise it wouldn't be Treasure, I guess. But Lucy, my uh, assistant and right hand for so many years, we do it together. Sometimes I like something that is not going to sell. We never know. This you never know until it goes into the showroom and until the buyer comes and uh, puts the seal of approval. Fashion, the inside story, will return in a moment.
We now return to Fashion, the Inside Story. What do you consider your greatest strength as a designer? I think we make intelligent clothes that are wearable. I think we, we make clothes that make a woman, makes a woman comfortable, pretty. Um, and I think that we are not in a very low price merchandise. I mean, after all, we are not inexpensive. What is the price range of your clothes? Oh, we're not going to discuss that. You're going to pay a thousand dollars for a dress and wear it for five years, divided by so many years, so many days, it costs you 50 cents a day. So <laughs> I think that quality merchandise is something that's always very much cheaper at the end. The quality of the workmanship is there and the quality of the fabric is there. If you don't like the style, that's fine. It's uh, my problem and not yours. You mentioned before another thing that you do at Trigère is use a live model to drape the clothes. Is that a method that you still use? Oh, of course, because I don't sketch, you see. I take the fabric and I cut directly, I drape it on a... So I need, I need the girl's reflection in the mirror. I work here and the mirror is there. And I look at her in the mirror and I see if she's like that, I say, I'm not in the good track. But if she perks up, I said, oh, maybe I've got something. Mm -hmm. So I do that and I do that more at night. I need, it, you know, I need the quiet of the evenings to do that because the telephone is a wonderful instrument, but it's also the enemy of the people. <laughs> so during the day, I'm on the phone a lot, but at night from five to seven, I can design. It may not always come to life or to be, but I can do four or five dresses that I think maybe in a week or so, I'll see, I do one half of a garment. I cut one half, I pin one half, and then I give the rest to an assistant. And sometimes it comes back and I say, when the hell did I do that one? I don't remember what, you know, it happens. What's most important to you in choosing a fabric, and where do you go for the fabrics that you use? Well, first of all, the fabrics we buy at Trigère, I would say that 90, well, 80%, 80% of the fabrics are imported. They come from France, from Italy, from England, from Spain, from Switzerland. But if you ask me what makes a fabric important to me, it's the quality. How do you make decisions as to what will sell? When we start a collection, we go in many directions, a fitted dress, full dress, a jersey, wool. we don't know. All of a sudden something happens that we know we are on, we think we are on the right track. So we have a little rehearsal in the show with the salespeople. That is not going to do, uh, this is too much, that's going to be too expensive. But all of a sudden, something everybody likes, so hallelujah. And even when the collection is edited, and we show 125 to 130 pieces, you know, the day of the show, maybe out of this we'll produce uh, maybe 90, because the final factor is not only the buyer who is in our show, but it's you, the consumer. You know, How do you feel when you come into a crowded room in a city that you've never been and suddenly you see one, four, eight trigères? I feel very good. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> I went to Columbus not so long ago and in the, in the audience there were three women out of the 200 at lunch who wore one had a coat that was 15 years old, the other had a suit that was, look, I'm still wearing it. I, you know, maybe I would have been happier if they had bought one yesterday, but <laughs> I was very happy to see them still wear the clothes and being happy with them. Isn't it something of a paradox, if an old story, that the designing of clothes for women is generally populated by men? I guess it may have been true years ago. I think that the fact that Oh, it's not, it wasn't true in France, maybe true in here. I think that the women here didn't have the courage, I suppose, to go and ask, ask, I didn't ask, it came to me, the money. Maybe there is something that frightens the woman in starting her own business, I don't know. I think women, maybe, maybe they, they, they wanted to mind their babies, their husband, their lovers, I don't know. It takes an enormous stamina to have a career and also have something at home. We've talked about comfort and about style and about taste. Now what about glamour? How do you define that? I think glamour is your makeup, your hair, your allure, your entrance into a room, the way you carry yourself and you may wear a 15 year old dress. You have it or you don't. Is there a special favorite among your designs? 
The dress you're wearing, for instance, is one of my very favorite. I own six of them, and, I'd, and I'm going to continue to wear it because when I am a little fatter or a little thinner, or I want to wear pearls or I want to wear a scarf, I know the dress is going to perform for me, and that's important to me. You have this in six I, different colors? Yes, ma'am. And I dress in two minutes because the dress, you put it on, it's got a zipper, and that's it. We know by now that you have a high sense of humor, but we know, too, that there's always some little edge to what you say. You recently were asked what you really wanted to be. Your reply was that you wanted to be a courtesan. It's an unusual aspiration, I think, especially in this last fifth of the 20th century. I, really, I think that was that was What did you really mean? I think maybe I meant that I would have liked to be pampered. Was a court, is a courtesan pampered? Yes, she's taken care of. I think that's important. But um, I've never was. Maybe, maybe that was in my mind. Being a courtesan, be someone that uh, people give things. I would have my wolfhound, my vodka, my carriage at the door, my, <laughs> you know, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> it was a dream. I can always dream too, like everybody else. You know? After all this time here, do you still think of yourself as being French? Oh, no. I think, accent and all, I'm terribly American and I wouldn't leave any other place. This is my love, my life. This country has been given to me. Well, I selected it and, and I love it, but I couldn't live in France anymore. What has been the greatest satisfaction in the course of your career? You know, I was born the little girl of a tailor and a dressmaker. And here, I mean, I didn't know anything. Now I have fabulous friends in all walks of life, I mean, in the, the art, in the theater, in uh, the restaurant business. So I'm very proud of my friends and the achievement that came to me because of my work. What's been the greatest frustration of your work? The moon, the moon, the full moon, when everybody has a temper, including me. That's a frustration. <laughs> I like to do more than what I can. My frustration also is not to be able to receive uh, people at my homes, my two homes, as much as I would want because time is of the essence and it's difficult to work late at night and to go and start uh, cooking or doing or do the flowers. That's a frustration, but I do my share. Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has? I never even thought about it. When I think of the thing that I haven't done, like for instance having a lot of time to spend with my granddaughter, that's a joy that I would like to have for many years to come. Do you dress her? She grows too fast, so... I dress her doll. I think that I am permitted to do that. <laughs> she has the best Trigère dress doll in, in America. <laughs> if you had your life to do over again, is there anything that you would have done otherwise? Yes, I would have married a rich man, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late for that. Oh, yes, it is. I'm too difficult. If I have my life, I wish I were not so volatile, not so difficult, not so temperamental. Oh, maybe I could be, make an effort and be all that tomorrow. As for instance, I'll tell you something. A bad day for me is when I said, gee, we haven't done one good dress, there isn't one skirt, there isn't one sleeve that I like. But if in one day I see a good dress or something I think is a good dress, I'm very happy. Well, by coming here today, you've made a lot of people very happy. And special thanks to you, Pauline Trigere.